Okay, once again, welcome everybody to coaching a team on the first LEGO League Challenge Innovation Project. Um, so, skipping right into the next slide. Uh, this slide, I'll let you read, but it lists uh, some relatively famous innovations that the children have come up with. Uh, you'll notice that they're a bit all over the map because they represent several different seasons where the theme is different. Um, We'll get into the fact that uh, each year you need to restrict uh, what the uh, kids do to the th season's theme, uh, but that'll be more obvious uh, later. It's best to think of the innovation project as an engineering project. The uh, process that's recommended is not exactly the same as professional engineering, but has a lot more in common with that than it does with uh, what people usually think of as a scientific method. Um, there are many scientific methods, but the kind of semi-classical one is the one I've listed on the left. Um, and the semi-classical engineering method that I've listed on the right. Um, the Both of these have something in common and that, that they're circular, and the next uh, slide that makes that more obvious. Another thought is that uh, classroom instruction uh, is usually guided to a particular solution, uh, some, usually something that's been discovered by scientists and engineers, uh, while the process that most engineers go through, and even more true of the innovation project, is uh, the kids choose where they want to go by choosing a problem. Uh, and they, there are many possible solutions to that problem. And, and they get to decide what solution they want uh, to create or improve. So shown graphically, uh, you can think of it as this circular process. And we'll refer to this circular process uh, several times tonight. Um, it won't be exactly what's shown in this diagram, but, but pretty close. You can see the definition of the problem here at the top. Uh, uh, planning solutions, making a model or a prototype, testing, and then uh, communicating, reflecting, and improving are these themes of, of the green circle. So in this workshop, we're going to present a process, and much of what we're presenting is what first is expecting each team to do. Um, although there will also be presenting a variety of ideas on, on how to improve that process uh, for maximum benefit of the kids, but you probably won't have time to do all of the things we'll be talking about tonight. And the kids may not have uh, the process maturity, the intellectual maturity, or, or be quite the age to do everything that we can uh, suggest. So you can use some judgment about what you, what you emphasize during the season with an eye towards future seasons and how you might improve it later. An important thing to remember is that it's the kids' project um, and that adults play a supporting role. The coach is best uh, uh, keeping the kids focused and asking them questions to keep that focus, uh, but not giving them the answers, not tell them what problem to solve, not uh, suggest what that solution is. Um, the learning is much, much better if they go through the process and choose their own problem and choose their own solution. And we'll talk about how to guide them in that process, but uh, you can stay well away of uh, specifying what they do. And that goes for the parents involved as well. The parents can play important supporting roles, um, but uh, the kids need to do the work. It's their project. Did you want me to comment at all, Bruce, on this slide? Yeah, sure. Yes, and this was going to be your slide. You didn't mention that. You did a nice job presenting it. Yeah, uh, as Bruce said, I've been involved with ORTOP a number of years. I, I was the uh, the lead project judge. I would train the other judges for prob probably about ten years. Uh, the project's always been my favorite part of the competition. 
And then I had opportunity to do some coaching. And when I first started doing the coaching, I actually had parents lead the project. And that's something that you can do if you have um, parents that are interested in that. Uh, and I found it was interesting because sometimes you can just get too personally involved with the project. <laughs> you get excited about it. You have some good ideas on how to solve it. And, it, and it's hard to kind of hold back sometimes. So you just have to kind of watch that, be conscious and not do overdo it with the kids. It's it's uh, fun to try to lead them along. You know, if, if they get off track, you can ask them questions about what might be wrong with what their approach is. But it's, it's real important that they learn that process of defining a problem. Don't give them the problem. Let them come up with a problem um, and research different problems. Uh, We'll talk about that in just a minute, but it, it's important, uh, even when you get down to the end of the project, when you're doing the, the presentation, they should come up with a script. Uh, they should do the posters. Uh, it's, it's tempting to kind of help them, uh, and you can do that, uh, but, but don't do the, the uh, word print out of the slot of the poster. They should do that themselves. Uh, uh, of course, it varies some with the age of, age of the team, because the Youngest members might be in fourth grade, and the oldest oldest teams might be ninth graders, and there's quite a skill level difference in there. So, it, and it also helps if one of the older members have been around and can can lead the rest of the team along. So, yeah, good. <laughs> so, one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that they. The team understands what the what the challenge is, and, and what I would do uh, is show the challenge video that first comes up with, and then just discuss what the challenge is. Ask ask them in their own words what is the the challenge. Uh, uh, you know, the theme this year is called replay. Well, what's the challenge with that theme, and and discuss that uh, so they really understand what it is. Uh, and the challenge also talks about a problem related to the theme. And in some cases, like last year, the uh, the problem actually was a constraint around the solution. You were supposed to find a problem with a public space or building, and there is no constraint as to what the problem was. And, and one of the things that I, I found is that kids who are uh, excited about what they're studying in school will, will maybe have studied things like uh, climate uh, change, and, and they'll try to bring those into the problem because they're familiar with that. Uh, and that can work, but you have to be careful that it does tie closely to, to the challenge. Uh, and just like adults, so often uh, be tempted to think about solutions before they actually have a good understanding of what the problem is. So you have to kind of watch that when you, when you, when you help guide them through the process. So identify has to do with clearly defining the problem and researching it. Design has to do with it. they need to innovate and do it largely independently uh, and do the planning. And then they need to create ideally a prototype. And we'll talk about what that might mean. But oftentimes a drawing or a model of some kind. Um, and then they need to share their idea. Sharing is very important, uh, both to develop their communication skills, also to benefit uh, uh, the audience that comes up under creativity, um, but the sharing also allows them to iterate and make an improvement. So if they can find the experts uh, or people that could use uh, their solution, they're more likely to come up with a somewhat polished solution uh, by the end of the season and be able to present that to the judges. So Ben, you want to talk about identifying the problem? Yeah, I touched on this briefly when I talked about uh, it's the it's the kids' work, kids' project. Um, it, as I mentioned, it's really uh, useful to start off with showing in the video and gets their attention. Uh, and and quite often, first we'll have a a challenge uh, manual of some sort that will have some questions in that will also help clarify what the problem is all about this year. Uh, and then you ask the team if you know if they've had any you know personal uh, encounter with 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 the uh, the problem or the challenge, or they know somebody, maybe their parents or some friends' parents that are engineers or researchers or 
or involved in some way with with a particular uh, project and theme. Uh, and it's good that to do that to kind of get them going with the conversation. Another good resource are especially if in the Portland area with Portland State. They're doing a lot of interesting things there. And it's you can just go to the website and have the kids go to the website, see what kind of research they're doing, see if there's some tie into your to your project. Uh, I, and I, the, the way I would typically do it, I think we'll cover this in, a, in another slide, is you uh, have them kind of just list a bunch of ideas, what, 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 what might make a, make a good problem, and then, then have them go off. And sometimes you can use that time um, to have them do some web research on, on the various problems, and they can actually find out some things in real time. It's good to keep them busy, and, and they're pretty savvy at, at uh, doing uh, web searches. Quite often, they'll just talk to their phone and, and get some answers there. So it's interesting watching them work on this. Okay. Oops. So it's Megan's turn. Yeah, Megan, sorry. That's me. Um, can you hear me relatively well? Yes. Okay. Um, so. Uh, ben just mentioned that, that this is the next step, right? Brainstorming to choose a problem. So one of the things that we do when we're teaching um, in a math class to kind of take the anxiety off coming up the, with the right answer or an answer for kids is we ask them to throw out crazy estimates to give us a range. And something um, like that technique can work here. So for the first round, you have your team members just throw out crazy ideas, right? Things that, that everybody knows might be slightly out of reach or, or really, really out of reach, but it kind of takes the pressure off of coming up with the perfect idea first time, right? So if um, I had a student, we were we were talking about um, natural disasters and how and how architects think about building houses in areas where there's natural disasters on a seasonal basis, and one of the ideas that um, one of my third graders came up with was. Well, what if we just put rockets at the base of every house, right? So that's a that's a crazy idea. It's not going to work, but coming up with something like that takes the pressure off of coming up with a perfect idea for the first round. And then you go back through and you say, okay, now we have our range that's that's bounded on on both sides by something nuts. Let's build on the base ideas and those initial suggestions and see what we can come up with that maybe is a little more feasible, a little less crazy. When you're doing something like this with a group of kids, give them as many of the jobs as you can. So make sure that the recorder, the people, the person who is going to be um, taking notes or making a record for everybody to look back on, that's also a team member, right? And they can go high tech or low tech. They can use um, you know, big sticky paper in their rooms or they can use a shared Google Doc. Um, anything that works that are going to be able to be referred to um, in, the, in the following steps so that you can look back and see your process, that's going to work. And then also making sure that that record is shared out afterwards. Next slide, please. So you go through, you take it down from totally crazy to you know, a handful of ideas that are maybe feasible. And again, all of this is going to be based on what students or, or the kids, the team members are thinking about. You don't want to put too much adult in there yet. And you're going to narrow it down to a handful of ideas. Um, depending on how many, how big your team is, it might be two to four. Um, definitely more than one, right? So two is kind of your low number. And if you have a big team, then four might make sense. You're going to make sure everybody understands what those final ideas are, and you're going to divvy up, okay, let's do some initial research. Let's find out what's already being done. Let's find out what it would take to do what we want to do. Let's find out who we can talk to. And you're going to make a plan that says, in two weeks when we reconvene, let's share our research out with everybody, and let's choose the one that makes the most sense for us this season. So this is an example from a previous season called Trash Check, where the theme roughly stated was reduce, reuse, and recycle. And the challenge was stated as choose a piece of trash and identify a problem uh, with the way it's currently handled. And, and you can read the rest of the challenge. 
the point of this slide is before the kids launch into choosing a problem, they really need to discuss what that overall theme is and understand uh, the subject area, the constraints on the subject area, the problem area, any constraints on the solution area. Um, one of many, many teams uh, came up with this problem statement. Um, relatively clear uh, uh, problem statement that allows them to research further uh, what's being done in the area of plastic bags and perhaps refine the problem further and then begin uh, thinking about what solutions they're going to uh, go for. Um, and Ben has some thoughts about contacting professionals. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is a, I'm sorry, thanks, Bruce. Uh, this is a good time to, to actually bring in professionals or maybe some parents. Uh, that might know something about the problem. Uh, the year that we had a challenge uh, called, uh, oh, I guess it was called in, in, um, in the orbit or something like that uh, two years ago, and uh, the problems with long distance space travel. And and our team uh, got real excited because they 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 went to this uh, uh, local fabrication shop in Portland, and they got interested in uh, astronauts doing training by this. Uh, simulated weightlessness, and they, they called it the vomit comet. Kids really, you know, sink that into that uh, phrase. And so they got all excited about solving that problem. And then they, they realized that, well, after three or four days, that problem goes away. So they had to change their problem. So, yeah, and that's fine. Uh, that's really a good experience for them to, to, to go through that, look at different problems, re research them to, to a point where they know it's uh, a different, definitely an existing problem. And they wouldn't have stumbled into that unless they had visited some some experts in that area. Uh, it's best if you can actually go to the facility where these experts uh, work. We actually had an opportunity to go to Columbia Sportswear and see some of their design people there. Re really good experience. And the uh, companies usually enjoy working with these kids, too. They like to see kids interested in what they're doing. It gives them a chance to talk about their profession. And that also helps promote the ORTOP and FLL in general as, as, as a program. Uh, and so it was good too to get the kids used to thanking the team, send them a letter or, or email thanking them after the visit. And because um, quite often it, it, they, the people you visit early on are interested to see how they come up with solutions. And it's nice to make those contacts uh, at the beginning. Uh, and that's where you can help. Uh, but but it's, uh, the kids, if, they're, if they wanna connect with a professional, it's best if they actually write the email, you might have to edit it some, but that really makes it a lot more uh, effective if, if the kids are asking for that contact than for the uh, coach or a parent that's working with them on the project. Back to so, you, Bruce. The problem, but this notion of brainstorming also applies to solutions and perhaps even more so. Um, so they can, again, make that two-pass uh, process that Megan talked about of uh, each kid suggesting a crazy solution and then making another pass uh, where some of the uh, solutions will be based on what the kids have heard from each other and then a pass at narrowing it down to perhaps uh, two or three solutions. Uh, if they're li very limited on time, you, you might have to encourage them to take a vote once and for all, pick the solution and and continue on to the next steps but uh, if they have a little bit more time they could have uh, finalist solutions uh, and they could assign team members to research those solutions because almost always uh, there's been something done that's either the same or similar to their original idea uh, and if they find something that's already been done they can think about how they can make improvements on that existing solution. Maybe their idea was already different from what was already being done, but now that they know about the uh, so-called professional solution, they can refine their solution and refine how it's better and different from what's already been done. There's many, many different uh, dimensions to how things can be improved. They can be improved uh, by reducing the cost, by making it more accessible to third world countries, you name it. There are uh, a variety of ways uh, to innovate uh, on top of innovations that have already been done. 
So here's an example of three different solutions to that plastic bag problem that we thought had a pretty good problem statement earlier. And I'm not going to uh, read these solutions, uh, but you can see that for each solution, uh, there are some things that kids need to follow up on. And these are just some suggestions. They, uh, they may come up with better ideas on how they would want to follow up on their solution in order to uh, learn more about what's already been done, how they can improve it, how much their idea would cost, et cetera, et cetera, how they would reach their target audience, uh, how, how they would make their solution understandable, how they would encourage people to actually use their solution. Again, many dimensions. Um, if they actually had decided on multiple finalists, then they need to come back together and choose one final uh, thing. There's multiple ways of making that decision. They could do uh, ratings, compare and contrast. When, as a judge, I asked the kids how they decided, uh, it's usually some kind of a voting process, uh, uh, but sometimes they'll end up research, uh, reaching a consensus on their own. So once they've chosen the finalists, uh, it's important, unless they're just plain out of time, to find uh, experts to consult. Uh, and perhaps in parallel with that, find potential users of their solution. Sometimes the experts have really good insights, but they're stuck on the existing solution. And if the kids talk to potential users, they may be able to uh, innovate in new ways that the professionals haven't. When they're doing this research, they need to think a little bit like the journalists, although most of the kids won't uh, have had a journalism course. These questions should be familiar to them. Who, what, where, when, how. Um, think about the solution from all those different question words. Um, think about the cost. Uh, think, so, think about how it could be reproduced, distributed, um, how people could be educated to uh, use it, etc. When they're researching sources, uh, they need to be skeptical. Uh, sometimes they'll get an opinion, and those opinions can be valuable, but they're not the last word on the subject. They can have their own opinions. Other experts may have other opinions. Sometimes there'll be a fact, and that fact now needs to be interpreted and applied. And other times they'll come across a fiction. And you can help them ask the skeptical questions to try to discern which of what they've discovered are opinions, facts, and which are fictions. Another step is creating a prototype or a drawing. Um, and the prototype might be an app. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It might be something made out of cardboard. Uh, glue guns can be your friend in prototyping. Um, the uh, Team may decide that they don't have time or the budget uh, to create a literal prototype, but a drawing can serve much of the purposes of a prototype where once it's drawn, uh, they can share with each other and try to discover what the flaws are to try to think about the cost and how it would be reproduced if it needs to be manufactured, if it was ever to become a reality. And the drawing or prototype can be shared with potential users and experts. If they decide they want to create an app, there's a variety of ways of doing that. Uh, most teams won't have time to create an app, but we've seen a few teams that have begun to create an app. Um, and there is uh, technology that was developed in, by both MIT and Google. It's kind of been passed back and forth right now. Uh, it lives uh, on an, M an MIT server uh, where you d develop an app, uh, much like you develop uh, programs for the robot by dragging graphical elements on the screen uh, and then uh, going through a process where it generates the app and that app can be loaded on an Android phone and tested. Uh, I'm not saying that the, uh, many teams should do this, but I'm uh, just saying, uh, like I said earlier, there are many, many variations, ideas that uh, the team could consider. A concept model uh, is similar to a drawing. Uh, where it's nowhere close to what somebody could use, but it helps them uh, think more concretely about their idea. It might be diagrams, it might be illustrations, it might be a storyboard. Um, another idea is to 
take an existing solution, hopefully it didn't cost too much, and um, at least figuratively drill holes in it, make it better. Um, uh, figure out an improvement to an existing solution. Think about how uh, their prototype or the model could be tested. And testing is more than uh, does it work. It could be how uh, reliable it is, how useful it is. And they won't have time to do all that kind of different kinds of testing, but taking them through um, that notion of testing is a valuable part of the learning process. I'll let you read this slide. Uh, uh, their kids uh, discovered there was an existing solution uh, for dissolving styrofoam and, and turning it into a glue. Um, and they had different ideas about how to improve on that solution. Um, and uh, we, as we've talked about this particular project that real kids did, uh, you can uh, put at the bottom of the slide some other things that they could pursue. Uh, Megan, this is supposed to be one of your slides. You want to uh, say some more about this one? Um. I don't think there's, I mean, I, I don't want to read it, right? So I don't think there's a ton to say except that, um, just to reiterate that this, this process is about the, the kids doing the process, not about adults. So from identifying the problem to figuring out how to approach a solution and then, you know, all the way through finding various ways that the solution could go, it really is about the kids doing that work and not about the very, um, enthusiastic and eager adults who are there to support them. So one of the final steps in the process is to develop a presentation. Um, they can use any format. Uh, historically, we've discouraged using PowerPoint because that often would require setting up equipment and uh, they only give a total of 10 minutes with five of those 10 minutes being for their presentation. And if it took two minutes to set up equipment or, or more, uh, that's going to detract from their presentation. Uh, in this COVID season, uh, they may indeed uh, want to use some technology because the judging will probably be remote. But it may be even better for them to avoid technology and just have a webcam where they do a skit or a, a, a presentation or some other creative way of getting across their idea. Uh, we're going to take another look at the rubric in a minute. Um, oh, and this is supposed to be Megan's slide. Sorry, I preempted you again, Megan. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Um, I just, I again, I would, I would reiterate, reiterate that um, from my uh, years of experience working with students as they start playing with things like PowerPoint or um, Prezi that this is a place where a little adult intervention goes a long way. The medium really should not distract from the message. So transitions that are all fire and animations that um, go so fast that you, you know, are in danger of giving someone a uh, seizure, just have your kids take those out. <laughs> just as in every presentation that we do as an adult, as adults, and, as the, and that kids are doing as well they're in school, you want to really encourage them to show instead of tell. Um, see if there's a way for them to bring that creativity in using a skit or um, given that a, a, there's a strong possibility that a lot of, of these presentations will be happening in some remote, um, you know, on the remote hub or in a in a digital way, there are a lot of um, options for creating digital presentations that are not just slideshows. So um, you can use Puppet Pals, you can use um, Scratch, you can use a lot of things to either um, have the kids act out parts, right? They can do voices or um, something interactive so that it's not just a standard presentation something that they're interested in, making it personal and fun, and every member of the team does need to participate in some way, um, and also getting that practice in before they're in front of, of judges, and preferably more than once, because not only is it practice, it's also about getting the nerves out before it's officially judging time. Um, so one of the pieces that um, that we are interested in is, is this idea of having students, having teams share their work outside of, um, outside of FIRST. And so a lot of teams do some sort of presentation at school, whether it's to individual classes or, or um, some teams are able to present at all school assemblies, and that's wonderful. And we definitely want those things to keep happening. 
Um, but there are other ways and other people that are going to be interested in what your, your students are doing. So um, ben, mentioned, ben mentioned that if you were able to involve experts in the field at the early point of, um, of research and discovery, they probably would be interested in hearing what, where your students took this project. And they might be interested in seeing that final presentation. Um, so please reach out to them again, definitely with a thank you, and also with an invitation. Would you like to see this presentation that the kids did? Would you like to see the end result? Um, this year, the theme has a lot to do with public spaces. And so hopefully, your students are going to be thinking about what populations are going to be benefiting, what populations are going to be um, using, whatever it is that they think about and who's benefiting from it. And invite some of those people, some of the communities that you are, um, that your students are thinking about impacting into the space where they're presenting their solution. Because for some of our students, they might be presenting a solution that they themselves are going to be able to use. And for some, they might be going out of their comfort zone and thinking about populations that they are not a part of. So cast a wide net. Um, a lot of people are really curious what's happening and and what students are thinking about these days. And this is an opportunity for students to have that um, genuine audience. And then that last piece, of course, as you're presenting or as the students are presenting their work, is gathering that feedback. What does it look like if we were to take this prototype to the next step? What if, it, what if we wanted to continue on innovating and iterating? And what's the, what could we do that is better than what we thought of later, next season, or for a future version? So we showed this before, and this is just a, a reminder. And in the context of the presentation, uh, it's tempting for them to show just what they created. Uh, but there's ways of weaving in the whole process, and they'll do better with the judges if they weave in all five of these rubric criteria in their five minutes. The judges will have another five minutes to ask questions in these same five areas, but if they've already made a pass on it in some way, uh, the, the 10 minutes total will be used more efficiently and the judges will have a better idea of what they did during the season, which is what we want to honor, not just the presentation itself, but uh, the process they went through during the season. Uh, there's many videos out there. Uh, I, I just happened to find a couple to put on this slide. Um, I think most of you got a PDF from me today. I think that PDF preserves the uh, hotness, if you will, the clickability of the uh, of these two. So um, feel free to click on uh, those if, on the PDFs or uh, painstakingly type in uh, those, or just uh, go to YouTube and, and find your own favorites. So we went through a lot of material. Uh, we probably should have stopped and asked uh, for questions on each slide, but we're happy to go back to any slide uh, or cover things that we haven't covered. There are some other slides, but we, we put them at the end because uh, they're not essential to our discussion, and we'll go to them only if we, if we run out of uh, questions or things you would like to discuss, concerns you have, etc. cetera. So um, I will make sure I have access to chat. If you haven't found chat, uh, it's at the very bottom of your little control uh, rectangle with a plus next to it. Um, if you hit the plus, it gives you a little space called type message here. But uh, that's absolutely uh, not necessary. So I just shout out your question if you have one, but if you prefer to type it, it's there as an option. Went through so much material that your head is spinning. Now, one, one thing I can comment on that we didn't talk much about is, is how do you organize these uh, sessions and is it better to have separate days where you focus on the project or do you do the project and the robot uh, design and work at the same coaching session? Um, and what I have found is that the, the biggest challenge is actually with these uh, the kids I had coached was finding time where they can meet together. Um, they're so busy with other activities that you have to kind of pick times that work for them. And kids, uh, it, it, 
what we would usually end up doing is is uh, scheduling one session on the on the project and then at another time do the sessions on the robot. And sometimes the kids would meet between sessions to research some of the aspects of the, the project, the, the problem or the solution. We kind of pair them up and they would work together to research something and then they would come back. And that, that worked pretty good. Uh, the other thing that worked really well for us, we talked a little bit about the brainstorming, is we like to use these big white mm -hmm. flip charts that we would write on, and then we'd have those lining the, the room next time they came in, so they could always go back to that. It kind of uh, refreshed them uh, and refreshed the, the coaches going through it as to the, the thought process mm -hmm. they did, and it kind of shows them, emphasizes that circular nation, uh, that, that circular uh, engineering process. And you're probably thinking, okay, how do we do flip charts during COVID? Well, you may have a group of kids that already play together and, and uh, their parents are comfortable with them uh, putting masks on and actually meeting in person. Uh, but do be very careful uh, because uh, as valuable as all this learning is, uh, we want kid to keep the kids safe and uh, their families safe. Um, so you may want to go to technology equivalents, and I'm not sure what those would be other than I'm a, a big fan of Google Docs. And if you put stuff uh, in a Google Doc or in a Google Sheet, um, the kids can actually type at the same time. I've, I've seen adults do that. I haven't seen kids do it, but I could imagine that kids could actually type their ideas much as if they were uh, uh, had a felt tip pen in hand and were writing on a big whiteboard at the same time. Um, and they can they can doodle, they can diagram, they can sketch. Um, um, although that's a bit harder with with these tools, it, it is feasible uh, to to share various things online and simulate. And uh, the nice thing about the high tech tools is um, you've got a good uh, capture. If it was done on a, a whiteboard, someone's going to take a picture of the whiteboard. But using a high tech tool, you've got something. To, to pick up on in the next session or to email to the kids or to send them the links for them to look at for follow-up. Um, this might be a good opportunity for uh, others of you to uh, to suggest some of these uh, techniques for brainstorming both generally and uh, specific to COVID. And after we've talked about that, uh, I see one uh, suggestion in uh, the chat that we'd, we'd like to address as well. So anybody have thoughts about how you would take kids through the process uh, with with social distancing and, and uh, make it uh, fun and, and learning for them? Uh, everybody's being shy. So let's, let's turn to Michelle's question. Um, examples are, are uh, usually the way all of us learn. And what about this season? I don't know if it's a good excuse, but um, I have uh, uh, not studied this year's challenge. It has something to do with sports, and Megan started telling me about it. So I'm going to risk it, uh, uh, putting Megan on the spot. And uh, do you have any thoughts, Megan, uh, about how this process might apply to uh, this year's challenge? Well, um, I have I have some thoughts about what what might come out of it, but the process, of course, is going to be unique for each of the students. One thing that I I see I hear and I see when I um, when I look at the particular um, topics for the years, I I think about a number of the new playground designs that are, have been um, being built in the last couple of years that are specifically accessible for um, students and children that are not normally developing. So you have play areas that can be used by both um, a, a kid with um, normal physical um, attributes and one who might be in a wheelchair or who um, has a different sort of handicap. And what I wonder is if our students who tend to have a much more um, open thought process about things like that might come up with um, with ways to use space and um, especially shared space 
in a way that is going to be more accessible to everybody that they might know. I saw something on uh, the web today, uh, and I'm not sure I completely understood the coach's point, but it was specific to this year's challenge, uh, the notion that uh, the kids might be more creative if, instead of thinking about this in the abstract, uh, find a particular person um, that wanted to participate in the sport and interview them and begin to understand it from a particular person's point of view and then uh, take uh, go through the, the uh, problem development and solution development uh, to better address a particular person's perspective. And if that first person didn't have anything, then hypothetically you go on some other person. Uh, during social distancing, I assume that uh, these interviews would be done by Zoom or telephone or, or whatever. Um, but perhaps they could be done uh, before uh, things get too cold and rainy. Uh, uh, through some time of outdoor meeting, if, if enough distance and masks were used. Again, uh, safety first. Uh, anybody else have a, uh, a thought on this year's challenge and, and how the process might apply to that and, and how you, not what the solution would be or what the problem would be, but how you take the children through the process? Uh, one of the comments that, that I would make about uh, the project is that. Um, as I mentioned, I had done a lot of uh, judging and, and judge training, and and judges actually like uh, projects that are a little different. Uh, if they hear the the same project and theme every every other time, they get a little tired of that, and it's hard to judge them. Uh, so I, I I would encourage you to work with your teams to, to to try to come up with something that might not be quite what everybody would first think of as a problem in this area. Uh, that the kids are interested in. Uh, uh, just just a tip there. Um, again, it, for for this, I, I don't have access to to the uh, challenge material. Uh, you have to actually have a registered team, so I haven't really seen how they verbalize this year's challenge. I've watched the video, and they they talk about the basic problem of uh, people need to move move more. And sports is a good way for people to move more. That, that's about all I know about the challenge. And so you can, you can work with that in lots of different ways. Uh, but again, I would re encourage you to, to look at the material that FIRST provides, because they, they often provide lots of resources in addition to just describing the, the challenge that are interesting stories about people. Uh, and, and the other uh, source of information is actually the game. The game will have a lot of different exercises involving the theme. And the kids might pick up on something like that too. Uh, and I believe even this year they they get to build a model that represents their their project and have that as part of the the game. They did they did that last year as well. They're getting actually a little bit more specific that it has to actually represent their project. So there there's a tie in there that that you can work with too in coming up with a project idea. Uh, when it comes to Technology for uh, facilitating the brainstorming. Uh, Megan suggests Padlet, uh, which is uh, available via a website called Padlet.com. Uh, forgive my radio background, but that's spelled Papa Alpha Delta Lima Echo Tango Padlet. Uh, but you'll also find that in chat. And Megan, you want to expand on that? Sure. Um, so it's it's a very simple um, shared link that you can, you would set it up as the, the coach and then you would share it out to your team. And then um, what you, what each team member can do is, um, it's almost like a shared, um, oh, what are they called, uh, inspiration boards. So you can create a post that would go on the board that everyone could see. And that post can be text, it can be images, it can be, almost any kind of media file you can think of. And then team members can also comment and discuss the, the um, individual posts that are on the board. And it, it saves all of them. So that means that there's a record of the thought process. Um, if any of you are classroom teachers, you can use it um, for a digital version of Chalk Talks, um, which I found useful this spring when I was in a classroom and all of a sudden 
we were all sitting at home, not in the classroom. Um, what that meant is that there's a way for, um, Chalk Talks are a, a teaching method of having students interact with each other but not speak. Then it gives a lot of students who might have, um, who might need a little more time to process, right? They're not always the ones with, the, with their hand in the air um, first off. They, are, they need a little more time to think about what they want to say. Gives them a chance to, um, to do that in a low pressure environment because it's not about who can express themselves verbally the fastest. It's about um, writing your idea up and then having lots of different responses to it. And so Padlet offers that as a way, um, both in real time and you can say, coming into a meeting where we're going to going to be talking about the innovation pro um, project, let's set up this Padlet four days before and you just throw whatever ideas you have on there so that we can start the meeting with really productive um, uh, conversation starters, right? We have something to um, we have something to discuss instead of brainstorming in real time. Additional thoughts, questions from anybody? Well, uh, let's see, by one o'clock we've got uh, seven minutes. Uh, so anybody that would like to adjourn uh, early, uh, thank you for your attendance. But anybody wants to stick around for about five more, I'll, I'll cover a couple more slides in case they uh, provide additional uh, help for you. But you also should have a PDF of these. If you didn't receive a, a PDF, uh, send me a one-line note, and I'll make sure you have that link. Um, so this slide talks about the importance of the innovation project. Um, and alludes to the uniqueness of it, how, how it complements classroom instruction. And it also makes the, the point at the bottom, that in addition to the real importance of, of the learning uh, and the enrichment of the children, uh, it does count 25% towards the overall awards at the tournaments, the Champions Award, the Young Team Award, the Rookie Award, et cetera, uh, are split 25, 25, 25, 25 across four different areas. Um, when it comes to uh, researching the problem statement, uh, here's a couple of slides on what, what it means to research a problem, uh, uh, what's already been done, uh, has, how somebody solved uh, a similar problem, uh, are there other solutions that you didn't think about initially now that you've done, done uh, some research, um, uh, Another point it makes here is that the research uh, is an opportunity, both on the research on the problem and on the solutions, to discover what's already been done. But the kids need to keep track of what their innovation is versus what uh, shoulders they're resting upon or climbing upon, depending on your favorite metaphor. And uh, while first doesn't require a formal citation process, um, being able to uh, mention that in their presentation, uh, uh, what their sources were, uh, where they got some of their ideas, um, and what was unique about their innovation uh, is a good critical thinking process, and it's good ethics as well, um, something that will be important to them as they get into high school, college, and careers. Yeah, what, what's especially important if they talk to experts for them to know who those experts are and tell the judges their names and, and what they did. Uh, before we go to any more slides, a uh, question, could Ben elaborate on the comment that first off and provide some resources to help out with the project and where to find those? I just asked, this is Michelle asking the question because I'm checking like the team meeting guide and the engineering notebook and there's really not a lot of resources in there. It does describe the problem. So I don't know if you're meeting then like YouTube or on the First Inspires page or somewhere else that we might check. Yeah, I think that varies from season to season. Um, I'm going to leave the slides and see if I can find something uh, for a minute. Uh, but there may also be, have, have you already received this year's materials that come in the mail? 
I so, have the materials that are for the challenge. So they've got the mission mat and the instructions on the mission models we need to do, as well as the engineering notebook and the team meeting guide. So I don't know if there's anything else we're expecting to get, but that's that's what we've received. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. I I just read over some of the first. Uh, I tried to find some, but I can still I still have an account yeah. uh, as a. A prior coach, but since I don't have a team this year, I'm actually missing a tab that they talk about that you can click on. And I think this year, instead of mailing out a lot of the uh, engineering manuals and that material, they ha they have it online in digital form. But I have I don't have access to that. Uh, I forgot what they call the tab, but it's uh, when you go to my teams, it should be listed there off to the right. But I I, I don't have access to it, so so I just don't know. Um. Is my share screen still working? Uh, can you see? A, a yeah, your share looks good. I'm looking at it, and I'm looking okay. just to see how much of this applies to the innovation project versus the other. Yeah, versions. and there's also a chance that they will embellish this. You can see uh, that something was added on September 8th at the bottom. Uh, not not addressing your question, but uh, so you might want to return to this page on occasion to see if they add more here. Um, and um, Apparently, there's something else that you can access uh, online if you're a registered team and there's a click here thing. Uh, that may be uh, the same as what they mailed you, but it, uh, they may enhance that uh, with online material. Now, if you're not sure how to find this, uh, yeah. there is Bruce, Bruce but, uh, well, why don't you click here and they tell you how to get access to it. Uh, why don't you show them that? Okay. And then I, I want to sh make sure you know how to find this page. So with Google, oh, yes. um, I have another way you can do it. Um, so this is a uh, step-by-step -step on uh, accessing this information via the dashboard. And the dashboard is available to register teams. Yeah, it's got a tab over there on the right-hand side. It's got a, a box around it. Um, that's what I wanted to access, but I, I could not since I don't have a registered team. And I, I think that's where the material is supposed to be, but, but I don't know. So uh, uh, let's back up to make sure that we didn't. So, find. Bruce, I've, I've just put a link in the chat um, okay. to something from the blog that is Innovation Project Tips and Resources from, from last year. Um, Based on when it was updated last year, which was November 15th, I think it's entirely possible that they'll release something like that for this year. Um, but I'm not sure if you can um, get to the link that I just put in the chat. But that might be helpful, Michelle. I don't know if that's um, the kind of thing you're looking for. Yeah, and again, it's for last year, not this year. Yeah, you, those of you, uh, that have the chat open, you may be able to uh, left or right click on that to, to go there now. And um, if you still see the screen share, the way I uh, I, I found that was we, ORTOP has a new wiki. You may have seen my email on that subject. Um, and you don't have to type this whole thing. You just type ortop.org slash wiki and you get to this page. Uh, you then select uh, first labeling challenge and then you click on season specifics, and then you click on challenge and resource library, which gives you the stuff we looked at before. Um, and it also has that click here that uh, takes you to the instructions on using the dashboard available to register teams. So that gives you uh, a couple of different paths to get more information. I want to respect your time for the evening. Uh, you've taken a, a, an hour out of your personal evening uh, for the sake of the kids. Uh, last questions or comments before we let you go back to your evening? 